You are listening to Stepping from Stone to Stone, a podcast devoted to discussing Combat Silat, also known as Pinjak Silat Pertemporan, as well as the underlying themes, principles, and concepts behind all combat. Welcome to another episode of Stepping from Stone to Stone. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to Stepping from Stone to Stone. I'm your host, Aaron Chappell, and with me is Guru Sean Stark. Uh, we did it to ourselves again last episode. We did not name a topic uh, at the end of the episode. So, uh, like I've alluded to before, when we're professional podcasters, no doubt we'll be more professional about that. So after a short conversation, uh, we're probably going to do a shorter podcast today on weapons and how they are viewed specifically within uh, Combat Sea Lot. So, Guru, I... Sea Lot's kind of known in general as a very weapons-based art, uh, but a lot of those weapons are not maybe as uh, relevant to the the Western experience as they might be in some of the uh, more rural areas of Indonesia. Um, how do we how do we view weapons when it comes to our you know being Americans and uh, living in the society we do? Right. So, um, kind of the way that I try to keep everything, you know, in perspective is that if today I teach you something, I want you to at least have a chance of being able to implement today if necessary. So, that being said, um, I am not for complexity in anything, and this includes weapons. Uh, In order to sort of reduce weapons... Um, from yeah, or to reduce, reduce the complexity of using weapons I as much as possible pattern all of our empty hands uh, methodologies after weapons usage so that when a person gets there they have all the foundation movement structures etc and really only need to explore the weapon itself and some um, some of the unique characteristics of the weapon, you know, there's always those little tangential areas that happen, you know, with empty hand versus a weapon. But we have, um, you know, sort of generically hit all of it at the same time through our, our normal training. And I kind of take that approach when it as it concerns weapons, right? Because we don't really have um, the same types of agricultural weapons. Now, that that isn't exactly true, but the majority of us are not so aware of them. Um, I've actually thought it would be a fascinating thing to play around with a hay hook. Uh, I I grew up using them, and I think uh, I've seen people gaff themselves in the leg. So... I'm damn sure it can do the work. Uh, question is, what else can you do with it, right? So, I mean, there's that. You know, we do have grass sickles and things like that. Like those, those things exist, but really, the average person doesn't really have those uh, within their realm of existence on a day-to-day basis. Um, we could talk in terms of general machetes and things of that sort, uh, which you can readily find and you can use Um, most of us if you've ever done any camping have machetes um, in the in the box whether we use it or not especially Um, here in Florida yeah yeah and uh, so we have we do have some of those kinds of tools Um, but it always comes down to to me uh, is what is going to be most culturally Uh, pertinent and then moving from that into things that are a little bit maybe more esoteric or exoteric or whatever and uh, so we obviously look at everything first from the viewpoint of knife but more specifically uh, or even more more um, generically the way that I teach weapons is that I um, 
I really take a, a more simplified approach. I'm not going to define the weapon you use. I'm going to define the length of the weapon you use because I want um, the individual to explore it and because I want the individual to be comfortable with their choice of weapon or at the very least be completely interested and enthralled by it. So if you don't want to use a knife but you want to use a karambit or you don't want to use a karambit but you want to use a flashlight I don't really care. Uh, to me, a lot of the methodologies are going to be the same. Obviously, not the outcomes. A knife is not a stick, and a stick is not a knife. So, um, so you know, there's some things that change that way, and and to me, that's that's more in keeping with what it means to be a sealot practitioner, anyway, because uh, it really should be about adaptability right so it shouldn't really matter too much what is in your hand as much as your ability to uh, find the leverage of it and and then understanding your material um, well enough to know where that leverage would best fit so that tends to be more of my approach to weapons well it, it's interesting to me and I, I didn't mean to imply that you know the the agricultural weapons that we have are, are not completely different um, than what you know somebody over in Indonesia might have, but uh, they're just not present. You know, I even the, the machete stuff that you mentioned that's a little bit more uh, all present where I live here in uh, Florida with the large yeah. Latin community that we have. But I still can't go about my daily business with one in my hand. Yeah, exactly. Um, if I was in Mexico or Belize, you know. Most of the time, those guys look at having a machete as like, congratulations, you have a machete, you also put pants on this morning. Do you yeah. expect anything else special for us to recognize? Yeah. Uh, now, and I think we're, from conversations that you and I have had previous to this, we're still kind of exploring uh, pistols and long arms where they fit in in a PSP. And that's... Sure. To me, talking with people that are over in Europe and um, Southeast Asia, uh, kind of pretty much anywhere but America, um, there's not a real strong gun component because there's not a strong tradition and heritage of civilian ownership of firearms. Right. Um, so where are we – how are we kind of looking at the, the pistol from the perspective of PSP? Because I think there's some unique leverages there that just aren't present – in most contact weapons that we might otherwise train with. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, in many ways, um, I really don't treat it so different. Um, uh, obviously, the impact, pun intended, of a um, pistol or a rifle or a shotgun or whatever needs to be considered. But in some ways, you know, uh there are considerations like, um, you know, for example, the volume of a pistol going off by your head. Uh, a lot of people who claim to do gun defense don't really make any vast considerations for. <laughs> um, and uh, I know from shooting that you're damn sure going to make your ears ring at the very minimum being behind the pistol, let alone being near the muzzle. So, um, at but there are some other studies and things that show how you um, actually can have a drop in physical strength of up to 50, 60 percent just because of the, you know, volume of a a shot or any kind of any kind of large high high decibel um, noise. And having girls, I know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> I, so, I don't know if that's a drop in strength or a drop in will to live. <laughs> oh no! Like it literally is so loud. Sometimes I I I flinch. <laughs> um, and this is a thing, actually, you know. And I didn't. I had no context for that prior to my study of pistols. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, I'm not really sure how to answer your question uh, in. Um, you know, I, this is something they demonstrate, but I don't always know how to put 
out verbally, but uh, you know, much of the same considerations exist whether it's knife or or, or pistol. Um, you know, with the exception of uh, you know the deadliness, I suppose. But um, the one thing about pistol that's different is you have a single trajectory every time, and it is limited in its capacity that way. Um, where a knife continues to cut no matter where it travels, no, no matter how long it travels, you know, until such time as it's broken or dull or, you know, whatever. And so there's, um, there's actually uh, evidence that's um, out there that, uh, I shouldn't say evidence, there's fact out there that shows, you know, the, the point of a knife actually has much more pressure than um, many bullets, right? But um, or different types of rounds because it's finite, uh, and so you know there's there's just a, there's a lot of considerations in there, and, and I try to pay attention to it. But uh, you know, it, it dawned on me about I don't know 15 years ago in the writing of my second book that you know if you're serious about self-defense or any kind of self-protection process in the U.S., then you have to consider firearms because almost an equal share of homicides occur via either um, blades or or um, firearms. And, uh, you know, so... And both of those are... You know, I just had this conversation actually on the phone with somebody else. Both of those are statistically uh, pretty small scale, you know, if you consider the volume of people that exist in the U.S. Uh, Last time I looked, and I'm just speculating at the numbers, but the numbers have continued to drop, um, but they generally, if you take into consideration population um, uh, density and all these other factors, uh, even you know, uh, socioeconomic, race, um, all these other factors. Once you put all that stuff in the mix, the statistics of a violence occurring via knife or firearm um, are really freaking low. And that's not to dismiss it, of course, because it, if it does occur, you need to you need to have your <laughs> It's, a, it's one of those things where you um, it's better to have the tool that's not needed to not to have the tool that you need um, and so you know there's a lot of considerations in there that we try to make but I you know you have to be able to do those per weapon per leverage and until you have the specific weapon in hand you know you may not always know the best solutions um, and I should say, when the attacker has it in hand. One of the things that I try to do from a weapons perspective um, is to work from the side of um, I don't have a weapon and they have a weapon. And that is often also kind of unique in Southeast Asian martial arts. There's a propensity of knife dueling and stick dueling and whatever kinds of weapons dueling. And uh, I think that is amazingly fun to do, but I don't think it's probably all that practical. Um, and so it teaches you some skills, but it doesn't teach you uh, what happens when you're caught off guard and you can't get to a weapon. Or even if you carry nine different knives, you know, like some propose, you know, you can't carry those in every situation in your life, uh, at least not legally, right? And anytime there's metal detectors and you know, that kind of thing, you're going to be disarmed. So then what? So I, I like to work as much as possible from from that thought, you know, like what is the lowest common denominator here? And everything above that then becomes like, okay, this is a bonus. I have a chair in my hand or I have a bat in my hand or I have a book bag or whatever, you know, and try to use that way. Yeah, it's interesting to me, um, and you kind of touched on it, 
there for a moment. Um, one of the areas that I like to skim all the best stuff. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one of the, the areas that we've really focused on down here in Florida, um, a lot of my guys are, are very tool focused. Um, usually running a, a pistol um, and some kind of inside the waistband holster, appendix carry, which is kind of just to the right of your belt buckle. Uh, yeah. It's really popular for us. Um, and then a straight blade um, or a fixed blade um, to the left of the belt buckle. And when you were talking about you can't always get to it, that in-fight weapons access is it, it's a, not a sexy thing to train. It, it actually sucks to train because you usually end up getting hit a lot. Yeah. But <laughs> there's a totally different um, quality to accessing a tool when you're just on a range going, okay, I'm going to draw from my holster and put, you know, yeah. two through the chest to this target that's paper and 20 feet away from me and one through the nose. Oh, look at you, Josie Wales. Yeah. Versus, <laughs> yeah. Versus, hey, this guy's going to be hitting me in the head now and yeah. I need to get this out because he has a friend coming over and the friend has a tool. So. Yeah. And, and what's funny to me, right, is that is that conversation needs to happen and you know we've talked about this but that conversation needs to happen in empty hands yeah nobody freaking addresses it well and then people address it right they don't address it consistently enough across all the systems out there right because frankly a lot of times you just get surprised and when you get surprised because not all of us are walking around you know like Jason Bourne ready to go obviously right so you get surprised sometimes. In fact, it's usually because you weren't paying attention, which is exactly what the perp is looking for. He's looking for somebody who's not paying attention. They're looking for weakness, and um, inattentiveness is weakness. So if you consider that, all of that same shit applies. It doesn't matter if there's a weapon or not a weapon, and uh, you need to train that way. You need to train for what do I do when I get hit? How do I recover to something I can do after that? And uh, and that, like I said, occurs with weapons, without weapons, with knife, without knife, whatever. It doesn't matter specifically to me. Yeah, it's that's interesting um, to me as well. You know, you and I were talking about visualization the other day, and yeah. the idea that this guy comes at you and you just freaking blast him in the leg and he crumples and everything you know that's positive visualization and yeah. then you know you have the the failure based visualization hey you turn this corner or this guy's got your attention and you're not paying attention to what's around you and all of a sudden you get sucker punched welcome to starting out your day really shitty yeah um and that's like I said yeah. earlier, it's not it's not a sexy thing to train uh, no. because you don't come away looking so smooth and and uh, together. Uh, yeah. But it's really necessary. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's always that point at which you know you you think everybody always thinks that they train martial arts, they're going to be the protagonist, they're going to walk away unscathed, they're never going to get touched. You know, there's this sort of mentality. You know, I did it. I mean, everybody I know actually kind of has that feeling in the back of their head that's why they sort of train right and then you you get to that place where you realize in an actual situation oh yeah i'm getting hit <laughs> and or cut or you know because we talk about it all oh if you had in a knife fight you're going to get cut there's no way to contextualize that but to actually be cut you know yeah i don't i I love that we talk about that at least, but um, that's not the same as actually leaking all over the place. Yeah, I've had some uh, incidents related to construction, and uh, it was interesting to watch a progression for me. Um, I was very blood averse when I uh, when I was growing up as a kid. Uh, my dad. He would always get green, and I kind of learned to model that behavior from him. <laughs> so, you know, I'd be swaying on my feet, wanting to pass out if I got a really bad cut. But after, you know, living a, a fairly active uh, young adult life and working in construction, now it's not that big of a deal. 
you but, know, you get ripped up by a bandsaw or a carpet knife or, you know, whatever. And where before it's like, oh, I don't feel so good. I need to go sit down, put my head between my knees, and hope I don't puke before I pass out and then pass out in the puke. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, okay, well, I, I need to duct tape and gauze for this. Yeah. As long as you got all your digits, you're still good. Yeah. Well, and going back also to what you said earlier, so I looked up, um, for those of us that are interested in it, there's a... Uh, report called the UCR, the Uniform Crime Report. Yes. It's data collected by the police or by the FBI from yeah, they just say local the FBI. police. Yeah, every year. So in Florida, uh, you were mentioning mentioning a downward trend. We're actually in an upward trend. 2015 uh, to 2016, we went up on our murders 15.2 percent. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you guys sound like Chicago. Uh, Chicago's had a kind of a rough year too. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we haven't thrown oh, block nice. parties because we went four whole days without killing anybody. But <laughs> you know, we're uh, in 2016. We had 561 murders, uh, which is a little bit more than one a day. So yeah. you know, we're 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 maintaining a strong pace, and it's interesting to walk, to look at the breakdown here. Um, it's broken into firearms uh, and knives or cutting instruments hands, fists, feet, and then other, which also, you know, includes impact weapons, and yeah. I'm assuming more exotic stuff um, yeah. as well. Actually, and and where do things like screwdrivers fit? I feel like they fit under bladed weapons. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, so, I mean, even when we talk about that, we, we need to be, you know, a little bit, we can't always think knife, it's not always that simple. Um, you know, whatever, anyway, just... Well, if it can well those statistics or... are statistics, but they're not they're not uh, as clear as all that either. They do give you those definitions when you look, though. Yeah. Well, for my purposes, personally, if it can stab me or cut me, I'm going to treat it like a knife. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. That includes axes. Uh, a friend of mine was a guest of the state for a while and got slashed with a piece of broken formica. Uh, yeah. Well, oh. on some level, right? Like, you know... Uh, I, I'll tell you what, those Formica cuts suck. I've had a few. Um, but you used to do cabinet work. They, I don't do it anymore, and I don't miss it. Yeah, there's a thing to me that, uh, you know, we talk about um, PSB, you know, per temporan means to uh, combat with many, right? So people talk to me about that occasionally, like, oh, well, you know, do you do any mass fighting training, you know, stuff like that? And it's like, well, Sort of. Uh, the reality is, if you're fighting more than one person at a time, you're doing it wrong. So I still don't see how it changes much. But um, but you start to bring in two or three people into, or four people into an ass whooping, and I look at it like they have a knife, regardless of whether or not they have a knife. There's that many people involved. I'm I'm certainly going to use whatever force necessary. Well, and that's being realistic about the disparity of force you know you and I have talked before if you have you know I'm five foot nine on a good day um, but if two guys that are five foot three come up at me and they they decide that they're going to work together to kick my ass I'm not the biggest guy in the fight anymore yeah exactly um, you know it, it's great to think that hey I've got like a good five six inches on these guys um, yeah. you know and if we were competing in a bar for a pretty girl or whatever that might help but they <laughs> completely tear me apart um, just because now I'm fighting four arms four legs versus two and two yeah exactly so, well some interesting thoughts and I, I, I look forward as we continue going because I think this is an area of PSP that's still developing particularly the gun stuff I'm, I'm crossing my fingers to get you down here for some of the force on force stuff later this year yeah um, I'd love to be there I, I mean we just gotta work it out it's that stupid real life thing if you would just yeah. cut that out um, I know right don't tell I wanna just do make believe yeah don't tell your wife I said that though she might hurt me <laughs> yeah um, but um, yeah I, I, I look forward to maybe revisiting this topic at some point in the future because I think there's some more to discuss here and what is I don't want to walk away yet because, I, I mean, one of the things that I see here that, you know, should be talked about, you know, that um, 
I think can sometimes be overlooked, right? When you're talking about weapons use, you know, the way that uh, I also look at weapons is like, um, you know, to me, a, a pistol is not just the bullet. You know, a pistol has other leverage capabilities. You know, I'm, I'm not really going to get into too much punching, but I might slap you with it. I might butt you with the, um, you know, the handle, whatever. And at the same time, right, like that's not much of a different process than uh, using a knife or a stick or a flashlight to do that any other time. And so um, when you get into traditional weapons, you know, weapons of a culture, right, like you know for a fact I like to screw around with whip. You know, and I've had people say, well, you know, whip's not very practical. You know, when are you ever going to carry a whip? And I think absolutely spot on. I do not disagree. Um, you know, but I also look at it and I go, I don't, basically, I do not st- strictly use a whip as a whip. Sometimes I use it as a weighted bludgeon. Sometimes I use it um, uh, as a flashlight in my hand idea. Sometimes I use it as a piece of fabric to choke or to catch or to, you know, otherwise harm. And, um, and so we can, you know, I think there's still some benefit in doing, you know, traditional weapons training, you know. It's just finding, it's just finding out what does that look like every day, right? Like, so for me, using a Chalura uh, is just fabulously scary both to use and to, <laughs> <laughs> and to um, which is a sickle, basically, yeah. a big ah. sickle. And uh, I like to use it um, because it does keep me awake and um, it makes me think in terms of, you know, hooking and, uh, and, and I don't have to have a bladed hook to use a hook, right? Like a, anything that would give me that round um, capability could be used that way. And likewise, it's still a blade, so I can sort of still use it like a machete. So anything... You know, in those regards, I feel like you can look at it strictly as being agricultural, but you can also look at it like it's it's play, right? It's it's that component of um, messing around with a with a with a variable in your hand and finding what its particular leverage is, um, and uh, whether you ever actually have that in a fight or not should you ever come across anything like that you now have uh, at least a basis for understanding its leverage you know and uh, I think that's that is the one thing to be said about working with you know traditional um, Silat style weapons right I know in, in Indonesia people are still mugged with Chalura and things like that probably not going to happen in the U.S. Um, I know people who have disarmed people who have tried to mug them with the Chalura. So, I, you know, there's value in knowing it. It isn't a skill that's passe over there. Uh, you know, and uh, so so anyway, so just, you know, for a little bit of balance in this discussion, I, I, we have to also think in terms of um, attribute development, right, and and uh, adaptability and understanding of context and things like that. So it's a bigger conversation than just, well, nobody has a chiller in the U.S. So, well, I definitely agree with that. Every every tool that I've ever learned how to use, you know, I, I've built in myself the attributes of critical thinking and analysis, you know, to figure out what this is and what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And then adaptability to make it, you know, make my movement fit the tool and also to figure out things that maybe the tool isn't supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, but I can make it do in a pinch. Um, you know, an a, a excellent example of that is muzzle thumping somebody with a pistol. Yeah. Um, from a shooting perspective, that pushes the slide out of battery, and it's not what I want to do. From right. an owl perspective, it's a terrible thing to do to a person. Yeah. Yeah, they're going to get at least two marks. Um, oh, God. I mean, we, we had uh, two or three years uh, ago here, um, 
we had a guy in, in one of our early trainings, uh, he was wearing two shirts and he got a little froggy with his training partner and ended up getting muzzle thumped with a, a safe uh, Glock 19. We had uh, insured safe and then run a paracord through the chamber so nothing could be inserted in it. So it was a trainer for that purpose. But <laughs> he ended up very visibly bleeding like a freaking stuck pig through a tank top and a baggy overshirt. Uh, and that was just a muzzle thump in the hip bone. And I, he was he was fucking done after that. He didn't want to play anymore. I don't blame him. I mean, the it'll Bruce take was, a divot out of you. No, yeah. no. Question. The yeah, Bruce was I mean, I, you know, the, I look at um, you know as I when we did the seminar in um, when was it? Maybe we did the street street seminar. When was that? September. Uh, since I helped put it on, I should totally know that. But yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway, last year. 2016 uh, we did a seminar in, in Florida there um, and we did it on you know street readiness basically and it was more just you know considerations of how to angle we did all kinds of things but um, one of the things that you know as I was preparing to go there you know I wanted to look at weapons differently um then, you know, oh, this is an actual weapon. I wanted to spend a lot more time, as we talked about, uh, intentionally looking at improv- improvised weapons. And I think that's the beauty of, you know, the traditional weapons is they give you some of the tools, right, to to look at something different um, than it is. So a pen, for example, or, or a small screwdriver or a pair of scissors or you know, a can of Axe body spray, whatever the hell it is. Like, you you can look at it then not as being the thing it is, but the thing you want it to be used for. And, um, you know, we were able to mess around just briefly with a plastic bag um, that, you know, because what I tried to do is look at, like, what what is the average person going to be most likely to have on them at any given time, which is, like, duffel bags or backpacks or computer bags or charging cords or um, you know extension cords uh, carrying gar- uh, um, plastic bags full of groceries you know and all that kind of stuff you know and and then what what are the most obvious ways to engage those and and anyway so all that you know comes from having explored traditional weapons that obviously are not going to be at my disposal so so I think there's there's certainly value in that and and then figuring out you know the, the real value then is to go okay so I have that basis you know that's not the end right that's just the starting point of exploring the rest of what you can do and and you know I'm I'm probably not going to be the guy who says a rolled up newspaper is going to work um i might if it's a really perfectly bound um magazine you know what i mean it's got the seam and everything maybe but anyway you know there's other ways to use a magazine right throw it at a guy's face so um you know anyway so there's lots of there's lots of potential in there and we just have to do the do our diligence to think that way and um, it's one of the things I challenge my uh, senior level people to is that they start to think about weapons, not just, oh, here's how to do it. Um, I will guide you in it, but I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You're going to have to tell me how you do it. And uh, that's a completely uh, uniquely um, CLOT thing, and uh, you know pretty much where I got that from conceptually so uh, that will lead to one of our future podcasts yeah that'll be an interesting uh, podcast absolutely hopefully here in the next couple of weeks so yeah well and like I said I think there's there's probably more conversation to have on this um, over time you know I, I wasn't aware I was rushing you out the door there Um, one of the things I enjoy about PSP and and any of the really the better combative arts that I've done is that they continue to evolve 
and it, it's always that quest for um, for knowledge. And I, I think for us, you know, weapons are a large part of that. Just repeatedly teaching yourself how to break down an unfamiliar tool, analyze what leverages it has, and then adapt your movement to it. Um, yeah. You know, that has a huge benefit all over the place, not necessarily in the areas that it would be most obvious either. Right. Um, I see. I see on a regular basis tools that I, I personally at least feel like having done some study of them. You know, not being. I'm not. Or I'm not a. Uh, I'm not proficient in every weapon I've ever picked up, but I've spent some time on some of the more popular ones, and I and I see a lot of things, ideas being perpetuated and um, exaggerated with them and it, it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting situation because it isn't that those things couldn't happen um, this is always the issue right what's probable versus what's possible and that applies as well to leverage in my opinion so there's like uh, what could happen with a leverage versus what probably will happen with a leverage or what's most um, uh, what the leverage most readily lends itself to and uh, so that's kind of how I look at, at weapons of any kind Sticks whether that's smacking. yeah yeah <laughs> you want to do a joint lock that's cool uh, it's fun right and it teaches you something that could I mean maybe happen and like you know once you've already smack the hell out of somebody you could put them in a joint lock probably not going to happen any other time and if we forget that a stick generally represents a knife or a machete or a glock or a brong or whatever then we're kind of missing the point of the training in my opinion but you know that's just one example i mean i see people using um uh weapons in reverse grip that uh, they want to try to make into forward grip weapon and the leverage is not it's just not really there um, and that's cool again you know it's a possibility and it teaches some uh, it teaches creative uh, thinking about a weapon but the danger lies when that creative thinking becomes uh, second generation and starts to become the application right uh, or third generation and nobody now is thinking it's it's creative adaptation and they're starting to think this is the application uh, and that then becomes a slippery slope for a lot of misinformation sounds fair well I mean it is what it is right <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of people who will disagree yeah and if they ever listen to the podcast maybe <laughs> We'll yeah, maybe we'll care email, about it. Email us, and uh, you know, that's. Um, it's not likely I will care about it. Just FYI. Well, what was your email again? Your specific email. <laughs> <laughs> I will absolutely respond to all of them that need to be responded to. <laughs> and with that massive loophole. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm not putting myself out on like that line. Nope. Well, you know, I, I feel like uh, seeing sometimes the difficulty in getting you to respond to things that you've already said that you're interested in, and that yeah. we've both agreed need to happen. I don't think people should hold their breath for some of the other emails that might be out. <laughs> yeah, truth. <laughs> so, all right. So, uh, in, unless you've got more, I mean, if you want to cut me off, that's cool. No, okay. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> totally cutting you off no I mean I, you know the original question was how do I see you know yeah the, those weapons in our context and and so I had a further thought and I didn't want to uh, end without having that put out there in a more complete context no totally uh, totally fair in my way of thinking um, you know we can't put out half a thought um, as much as my ADD might lead us to at times <laughs> Um, so in order to not curse ourselves uh, again by not naming a topic, I think we have a round of interviews coming up. We do. All right. And we were going to do, what, three of them? 
So the yes, round at least round one, uh, a three part interview series with three different people um, that have had either uh, success with PSP or um, advanced within it or helped build it um, or develop it or whatever. So I look forward to some other perspectives and people that are longtime listeners of the podcast probably look forward to hearing some other voices. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Guru, for your time, and we will talk to everybody next time. And that's a wrap. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I didn't mean to to throw you under the bus there with the uh, gun thing. Um, oh, no. Right here. I, I didn't feel that way. I just want to, you know, I'm just not going to. Thanks for listening to another episode of Stepping from Stone to Stone. To find out more about us, please visit us online at clot.us, that's S-I-L-A-T dot U-S, or combat-clot.net. You can also find us on YouTube at clotjunkie1, or you can find us on Facebook by simply searching for Penjak Silat Pertemporon. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Stepping from Stone to Stone.